Hello, and welcome to a live stream event with author Rebecca Tossig in partnership with Tattered Cover Bookstore and Denver Public Library. Before we get started, I want to let you know that closed captioning is available on this video. If you would like to turn that on, there is a black bar at the bottom of the screen with a button labeled CC on it. Click that button and closed captioning will be enabled. My name is Jen Dewey and I'm an adult programming librarian at Denver Public Library in Denver, Colorado. My pronouns are she, her. I am a light skinned 30 something woman with uh, long brown hair. I'm wearing a light blue shirt and I'm sitting in front of a blue couch in front of a white wall in my home. Um, I wanna say thank you for choosing to be here with us today. We are, we are very excited for this event. Um, Denver Public Library has 26 locations in the Denver area, and I wanted to let you know that they are all open for you to come visit. So please do stop in and say hello to us. We have all the things that you would expect to find in a library and maybe some things that you wouldn't, such as Chromebooks and hotspots available for checkout, small business help, tech help appointments, passes to cultural um, and, and museums and park passes for checkout, and so much more. So please visit us at denverlibrary.org to hear more about that and to see our hours and locations. This evening, we are so pleased to be partnering with Tattered Cover Bookstore, Colorado's largest independent bookstore. Tattered Cover is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, and that is thanks to readers like you. So thank you for supporting Tattered Cover Bookstore. The store has recently expanded this summer to include a new location at McGregor Square, right across the street from Coors Field, and a kids specific store at Stanley Marketplace in Aurora, which I cannot wait to visit. To learn more about Tattered Cover events, visit tatteredcover.com slash event. Tonight, we are thrilled to be talking with author Rebecca Tossig. Rebecca is a Kansas City based author who earned her PhD in creative nonfiction and disability studies from the University of Kansas. She runs the Instagram account, sitting underscore pretty, and her memoir and essays, Sitting Pretty, The View from My Ordinary Resilient Disabled Body is out now. So be sure to get a copy of that. Conversing with Rebecca today is my colleague, Denver Public Library Administrator of Older Adult Services, Amy Delpo. Amy has been a librarian at Denver Public Library for over 10 years. She is a lifelong learner, an avid reader, and a mother of three. Um, and I know Amy is very excited to be speaking with Rebecca tonight as well. So I'm going to welcome both of you back on screen with me. Hello. Hi, Jen. Thank you for that great introduction. Hi, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you. Hello, thank you. Yes, thank you, Jen, for that introduction. I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm very, I'm so excited. As I said to you before we were on camera, I feel like I definitely have the advantage because I feel like I've known you now. Um, as Jen said, I'm Amy Delpo. I'm a librarian. I am also a light-skinned woman with dark hair and I'm sitting in my daughter's room in front of a kind of blank blue wall. Um, and uh, Rebecca, I don't know if you wanna describe where you are because it's so vibrant. I would love to, yes. I love that um, Jen set us off on that foot. Uh, yes, I use she, her pronouns and I am sitting in my study at home. So there's a lot going on. I've got a bookshelf, a wall full of books to my left um, and some little tired plants uh, behind me and um, orange couch that will probably have some real life orange kitties um, walking across it at some point. And, uh, and yeah, I've got short brownish blondish hair, um, and, um, a t-shirt with, I should know it's, um, black illustration, black and white illustrations of, um, superheroes. Yeah. So that is what's going on on my screen. It's a lot. very, it's very vivid. <laughs> um, so I'm thrilled to be talking to you today. I loved your book. Um, I just loved it. For people who don't know you, who aren't familiar with your work, I didn't know if you could give maybe your elevator speech or your kind of little short description of who you are and, and your point of view and, and kind of your experience that you're writing from. Yes, absolutely. 
All right, elevator pitch in, in action. Um, I, uh, I grew up disabled. I've been disabled I, since I was about three years old. Um, I was paralyzed after um, cancer treatments on my spinal cord when I was really young. And I grew up in this big family, um, <clears throat> youngest of six kids. And uh, my disability just sort of became a part of our world without much fanfare um, or accommodations made, right? I just sort of blended in and we didn't really talk very much about that disability. Um, and I kind of grew up in a world where uh, my disability was very present and real and a part of every moment in memory, but very um, unexplored. And I didn't have a lot of language to describe what I was experiencing. Um, I didn't have a community that I was connected with. Um, and so I, it was sort of this background defining everything, but um, but without language to describe it. And so when I got to graduate school in my late twenties, uh, I found disability studies and I found a framework and language and um, stories that helped me understand a lifetime of experience in a body that is visibly quite different and moves through the world quite differently than a lot um, <clears throat> of others. And so when I found that, when I discovered that language, it really transformed everything for me. And I started um, writing more and more as a way to understand and rethink and reimagine and process um, uh, my life in this from this particular perspective. Um, and that turned into online writing. I started writing what I call mini memoirs on Instagram, um, just little snippets of life and processing moments and memories. Uh, and then that evolved into the book, uh, Amy, that you read. Um, so that um, eventually the online online space, you know, I started to find, feel the limits and confines of that. I think it's like 2,200 characters that you get per post. And, um, I needed to stretch my arms out a bit more and dig a bit deeper. And so the book was born from a lot of, of ideas that were born or that were, um, planted, um, during graduate school and during writing online, um, in that space. Well, I'm so glad that the book grew out of your online presence because I, Without the book, I don't think I would have discovered you. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, the book worked for me on many levels. In library world, we have this concept of books are both windows and mirrors. I don't know if you've heard that concept. And your book definitely was that for me. I felt like I got a window into an experience I don't have, which is um, being disabled in an ableist world. And yet so much of what you write about is there's a universality to it that I could really identify with. Um, I can identify with wanting to be seen for who you are. Um, and I can identify with wanting your culture and your environment to accept you and to not get in your way. And so I'm wondering if um, that's something you can talk about, uh, that the universality of the emotion, but also there is also... So, very specific experiences of someone who goes through life in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that question. Um, <clears throat> and I'm so glad that you experienced both the window and the mirror, because that's really important to me. I would want that for readers of this book. Um, when I first found disability studies in graduate school, I was so um, hungry for this framework that would help me understand my very particular experience in the world. And at the, at the, beginning part of that, as I was starting to rethink and process, I think I really clung to this idea that disability is a distinct experience, unlike any other, you know, and, and I was so hungry for that, like solidarity and, um, and ate up all, every single, per, every single comment that I received online where another disabled person said, I feel that too. I know that too. And that was a huge part of this transformation for me. But the more time that I spent online and connecting with people, the more I actually, it started to dawn on me that there was a lot about my experience that actually did intersect with or bump up against or have sort of the echo of experience um, that others outside of the category of disability have also experienced. In fact, I started to sort of see the edges of the category of disability as kind of wobbly. I started to see how people could kind of move in and out of that experience or, um, or eventually come to it later in life or, um, or have some sort of adjacent experience. Like even, I started to see that even like the experience of being uh, in a body that's menstruating or lactating, like there's a way that that, that kind of 
bends into or folds into this experience of having a body um, with a limitation. And so my thinking on my experiences started to evolve the more time I connected with people and kind of thought about my own experience. And I think one of the really important things for me in sitting down to write this book um, was to be able to lean into the very specificity, the, the very particular parts of my story and trust that there would be something universal in that telling. Um, I think even just from the perspective of a writer of creative nonfiction, so anyone who's writing a memoir, I think that there is a, a special talent to capturing just the exact precise texture of your own story. And I think that when we can do that, um, I think we often connect with one another, um, you know, in unexpected ways. And so uh, I, there was a lot of hesitation that I had in writing this book and just being, you know, um, an educated middle-class white, thin, um, cis straight woman at, that's also disabled, right? So it's like, what, what, what do I even have to say about this experience? And how can I tell this story in a way that um, will be meaningful or matter? Like, wh why do we care about this perspective? Um, but I think part of, part of what I had to grapple with was um, leaning into telling exactly my story as honestly and precisely as I could and hope and trust that that would connect with all different kinds of people. And Amy, that's why I'm so glad to hear your experience. It did. Because that's what well, I would- and I, and I have done quite a bit of writing and I, you know, there's a whole, there's an old saw through the specific, you get to the universal. And I, I think you very much succeeded in that. Like you were, your story is very specific to you and your family and how you were raised and your disability and your experiences. And yet you wrote about them so- well and with such um, detail and empathy that I definitely just really um, could, re I could both learn and relate. So it was really powerful for me. Um, so thank you for that. I'm so glad. That's just what I would hope for you to experience. Oh, good. It's, well, it's really great. But it um, help. Uh, at one point you say in your book, um, a group is only marginalized because society marginalizes them. Like no one's inherently marginalized, right? It's our culture um, that does that. And the good news, if you realize that, is that means that then society can change, right? And people don't have to be marginalized. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and how, how it feels um, to know that one, you are being marginalized, but two, that there are things that can change mm -hmm. and um, people can change and what that means. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that you pulled that line out because um, that was not always obvious to me. Um, I growing up, uh, I, I felt the impact of marginalization. I knew I was on the outside. Um, I knew that I didn't see myself represented anywhere. I knew that I couldn't get into places, all of that. Um, I knew that there were stories written over me that didn't feel true. Um, but I think for a long time, I thought that that was because it should be so, or that it was almost like mathematically inevitable, you know, like as if this is just the way that the cards fell because this is how it should be. And this is the way the wind blows, you know, and it's, it feels strange to say that now, but I think coming to that recognition of, <clears throat> Oh no, this, this has been constructed. There are choices that have been made that have led to this result um, was revelatory for me. And that simple sentence that you named was um, like a, a, a shock, but uh, to me to, re to realize and feel in my bones and shifted everything for me. So um, <clears throat> yeah, it wasn't, it was not obvious to me, even though when you say it on the page, it sounds so obvious and simple, like, of course, um, yeah. but and had been revelatory for me. So um, now I'm trying to remember what your original question was. Um, uh, well, I was more just exploring that idea. I once went to a conference. I, I don't know if you know the uh, leadership exchange and accessibility um, in arts and disability. Do you know that conference? It's, you. it's put on by the um, Kennedy Center and it's about making cultural institutions more accessible. Mm. And one of the things, and I went sort of not knowing anything about um, disability studies or accessibility, and at one of the very first sessions, they said, 
people are only as disabled as their environment makes them. And if you change the environment, you, mm -hmm. it's so simple. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so simple. Mm -hmm. And it never crossed my mind. And that's why I wanted to highlight the marginalization part because it's similar in that it's so simple and, mm -hmm. but people don't think about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> yes, I mean, as long as I have a way to get into my house um, and can access the space in that house, I, I don't even think about my disability when I'm home, right? Yeah. Like, and nobody, uh, I'm not running into people who are um, acting strangely around me or um, kind of writing that story over me. So I don't have any, there's not stigma in my home. Um, and even when I, um, you know, like, go out to, uh, to teach a class and ride the elevator up to the third floor, um, that, that pathway is made accessible to me. And it doesn't really matter if I'm walking or taking an elevator, like there's no meaningful difference there. And that is a, that is a, a really difficult concept, I think, for a lot of us to grapple with, because that's not how we think, of, that's not how we've been taught to think about disability. That's not how it's been presented to us as the default way of understanding, um, I'm used to people immediately seeing tragedy in my legs and not tragedy in the environments that are making that difficult. That's a beautiful way of putting it. You need to write that down, Rebecca. <laughs> that was a really good way of putting it. Well, you use the example in the book and it's really vivid of, well, yes, if the napkins are on the high shelf, somebody can come along and give me the napkins, but what about just moving the napkins? Right, right, so right. The simplicity of that. So we don't so we need to live off of a drip of like random acts of kindness, right? Right, but you can just think about the environment in a different way. We arrange the pieces, yeah. Exactly. Um, what, so the, one of the chapters that was quite impactful for me, all of them were, but um, in particular was where you described teaching the high school class for the first time, which sounded very painful. Um, and it, it was, I, I almost wish we could just talk about both chapter for hours, but one thing that I was struck by was for some of the students, there was this actual hostility um, to the ideas you were presenting. It wasn't that they weren't understanding and it wasn't that the ideas were new. It's that they really seemed entrenched in their own worldview and they did not want to think differently at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you have any um, thoughts about why mm -hmm. um, maybe they reacted that way. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, we could talk about this chapter for an hour. Um, cause there's so, there's so much honestly baked into the experience of that class. And I think anyone who's ever been a teacher and who's ever been a new teacher at a school, who's ever been teaching, um, a grade level that's brand new to them, we can understand all of the ways that that experience is shaped by, um, those forces. And so I think, I think to be perfectly honest about the big picture and complicated picture there, I think there were a lot of things that had nothing to do with the content. I think some of it was, I was a new teacher at the school and I had a lot to prove and they were seniors and they didn't, you know, like necessarily want to um, go along this ride I was paving for us. Um, I think I um, struggled with how to, to um, present that content to the age group, um, 18 year olds, uh, our unique brand, um, you might know, anyone who has an 18 or 19 year old in their life might know, um, there's sort of like this, I already understand the world, what would you possibly have to teach me? So there's some of that mixed in. But I think if we kind of put aside all of those understandable sort of inevitable parts of the complications of teaching, being a new teacher, I do think that there was something interesting happening with um, what I was asking them to rethink. And I think that um, there is a very, there are very, very deep roots, roots that we have to the stories that we tell about bodies, um, to the stories that we tell about good bodies and, um, and goals for our bodies and that we are very attached to. And I think that there is something rather threatening about disrupting that narrative. Um, I think that the <clears throat> disabled body can be a scary thing for people to grapple with at the core. Um, I think that there is something about the experience of disability that 
at our core, um, whether we would have language to articulate this or not, represents something that's inevitable for us. We all inevitably age. We all inevitably break down um, in all different parts of our bodies. And this is this will happen to every person who lives long enough. That's inherent to the experience of having a body. And we have stories that push that reality aside and, um, and tell us that if we do this or that, that we will avoid that, um, that we can, um, we can stay in this bubble and this is where we're safe. Um, and so I think there's something really threatening and um, that we don't want to think about. We don't want to think about um, this inevitable part of living in a body. Um, we don't want to complicate our picture of that. And so I think that the disruption of that and what I was really at its core asking them to rethink um, was, was rather threatening. I think even um, I'm thinking back on to some of our conversations about um, um, uh, ab abortion and, um, and the decisions to have uh, children with different genetic differences. And I'm thinking, um, how many of them will be presented with that as a parent one day, right? And there's something very scary about that. There's something very um, um, frightening, I think, for any young person to think about all of the inevitability of what it means to live in the world as in a human body. And so on its surface, right, on its surface, um, it's like, what is wrong with these children? How could they be so hostile to this friendly teacher, right? But I think that there is something underneath that that is um, really um, asking a lot. And at that particular age, when you're in the prime of your youth and you're ready to go out and live your life, um, I, don't, I don't know the intersection of that. I definitely saw um, what came up for them in that, for some of them, for some of them in that. Well, and you're, you, are, you speak with such compassion for them and with such understanding. Um, to me, it's ironic because even as it's threatening, I think thinking of yourself as just being in a body like any, that's not perfect. Like to me, embracing your ideas actually was liberating because no body is perfect. No body fits all of the ideals that our culture has. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, it was, if they, if they could have seen how um, the benefits of embracing everyone mm -hmm. and all differences, but you're right. It might have been a lot to ask. Well, and also, I'll just add as a like a caveat: I, the school that I was teaching at had uh, had a particular set of values that were very much about um, high performance and achieving and success. Right? Like um, we're going for the top scores and the top schools, and that that's a really strong drive. And to feel like, wait a minute, wait, like peak perfection isn't the ultimate, like the, the, that's maybe a myth or that's not sustainable or that, you know, like that, that or maybe even help. not all there is to life. Yeah. Right. The ultimate goal. What are you saying? So all that to say, I think when, when, when our narratives get disrupted, that can be threatening. Right. For sure. Yeah. Um, well, and I was interested to see how you adjusted the class. So, um, it sounds like you learned as well and, and things went better subsequently. Yeah. 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 I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And I think part of it was even just like ways to protect myself and, um, you know, still have conversations that mean something, but in a way that maybe isn't just like the most vulnerable part of the, you know, like, let me bring you all of my treasures. And do you care? You know, like, and oh. then you wrote a book that is all about vulnerability. Right? I know. Which leads me to my next question. Um, a big theme in this book is about representation and how important that is. Um, and you talk very vulnerably and very powerfully about the impact of not having representation on you, like not seeing girls in wheelchairs go on dates. So does that mean, you know, how did, then do you get to go on dates? And then even more profoundly, not seeing a model for yourself of mothers who have disabilities. And um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the importance of representation and even how you, you just ventured forward anyway, without that, but it must've been so hard. Yeah, I, I ventured forth with a lot of clumsy mistakes along the way. Um, so that's part of it too. But yeah, I, you know, I think it's difficult to 
fully understand um, the power of representation if you've had it. And so it, it can feel silly to say like, well, you didn't see a girl in a wheelchair, like have a vibrant dating life, but like that means you can't literally imagine it for yourself, but there's something very powerful about never having seen that picture in the world, both in a practical sense, like what would that look like? What would, how, what would it look like for me and a, a love interest to like mosey down the street together, right? Like, do we try to hold hands? I don't know how to picture it. And you think about a first date and like all the awkwardness that's already built into that anyways, let alone on top of it, trying to picture what it would look like. But I think even just to be able to imagine that that was something that belonged to me or could belong to me, that that was something that um, I was invited to. Um, it seemed as if every clue that I picked up in the world around me suggested that that wasn't actually really like for me, right? Like the narrative that um, I could find myself in or I could fit in would be one about like inspiring people right. or making them grateful for what they had, which of course would be like legs that could walk upstairs. I don't know. Um, so, so much of that um, is about what I could imagine for myself. And honestly, as a mom now, um, I'm, I'm like bumping up against that all over again. You know, um, I, I did manage to find, um, a partner that I love with my whole heart and soul and mind. Um, and so now, you know, I think I sort of had taken for granted that like we've made our own story and we have our own rhythm and we figured out how to go down the sidewalk together and it's not awkward. Um, you know, I think I've taken for granted that we, we, figure that out together without a model. Um, but now that I'm a mom with this toddler and looking around, like what does motherhood look like from a wheelchair and not finding that easily um, is throwing me more than I would like to say, you know, I wish that I, I wish that I'd learned all my lessons about representation and can kind of buckle down and be like, oh, I'll figure this out on my own. And in some ways, of course, like you said, I'm still going forward. Um, because what else is there really? But um, it's difficult. It's, it can be disempowering. It can feel defeating. It can be confusing, not just for me, but I think for everyone around me, you know, that people who see me with my son and have never seen a mom uh, in a wheelchair with a child and don't know what to make of that and are confused by it or, or, in, or uh, you know, like hyper aware of it. Um, I think all of us could benefit from seeing other representations of motherhood. Well, uh, and because motherhood is loaded, right, with the the um, burden of perfection, right? You're supposed to be a perfect mother, and yeah, and oh capable of all things. You you are. This is what I've felt so much as a disabled mom is like um, this burden to be all things to your child, which is such a setup for yeah. you and your child, right? Oh, like, yeah, I know. Right. Um, and so thinking like uh, very early on, I had to let go of some of that with my son. Um, I, he, he would only, there was a period of his life when he would only be soothed by his dad pacing and bouncing him around the house. And this was devastating to me because I wanted to be the mom that could comfort him and to let go of that and say, it is okay does someone else be the one who can comfort him was devastating. And also like, I feel like so healthy for both of us. Um, well, and I hope someone told you that children do that anyway. Yes. I mean, uh, you know, there's I, when my first child, she would only be soothed by her dad. I, I could do what you're describing. Yeah. That she wanted him and then it flipped. So who knows? It might flip again. You never know. Yeah, never it know. might. It might. I think that's right. I think a lot of it is very familiar. Um, and I, I think that the the punishment or maybe one of the punishments of being a disabled parent is that every, or for me, I don't want to speak for all disabled parents by any means, but for me, every little pivot that we take or everything that doesn't seem to be working perfectly, it's so easy for my brain to say, oh, it's because... Yeah. Right. As if, as if I could ever know that, or, you know, um, but my brain is so quick to bend that way. Yeah. I, and I understand that that's, I think part of being a mother as well. Um, there's a lot of vulnerability to being a mom 
Um, and I'm sure you're a wonderful mom, but uh, I wanted to, I think we don't have that much more time, believe it or not, it's just going by. Um, no. But you have an entire chapter devoted to the complications of kindness, um, which I imagine is one of the chapters you hear most about. Um, I don't know. I you're could correct. be wrong. No, you are a hundred percent correct. Yeah. Um, and it's a great chapter. Um, and can you talk a little bit about that? What, what is complicated about being kind, Rebecca? Oof. All right. Okay. No, Amy. Um, no, you're right. I, people, people are definitely want to talk about that one for sure. So when it comes to, um, disability and kindness specifically, um, the, we've talked about narratives a lot tonight and the narrative is very deeply entrenched, which is, um, that we have our helpless character, um, and we have our helpful character, right? And, um, in my experience of the world, um, my wheelchair can be so visibly loud that I find myself being pushed into that story over and over and over again in ways that don't make a lot of sense a lot of, to me. Um, and so I, I think that what I've really wrestled with in thinking about what that feels like and how to cope with that, um, it, it sounds like such a simple thing. And a lot of times what people will say in response to that chapter um, is like, oh, I, well, I love it when people offer to carry my groceries, you know, or like, I love it when people open the doors for me. And I, I think for me, what I've had to grapple with or what I, it's sort of come down to is um, this, this desire to be seen, um, this desire to actually get to play the part um, of Rebecca and not just um, the disabled character um, who must inevitably need my help right now, quick, like run across the parking lot um, to assist her. And so I, I guess what I'm hoping for in that chapter is that if we, if we want to be genuinely kind, we have to actually look at each other. Um, we can't just have these knee-jerk reactions to say, I see a helpless character, um, let me run, I've got my cape on, let me run um, to, to um, be the superhero in this scenario. Um, it requires that we look and listen and, and that gets complicated. Uh, I understand that a lot of times we don't necessarily know, um, whether or not someone needs our help. And of course, I think it's great when we, we can ask each other, but, um, do you need help with this or that? I actually really love it when people say, um, it looks like, you know what you're doing, but do you need anything? Right? Like I see you and I, what I see is that it looks like you're fine, but I'm also here. Um, but so often, um, disabled people have been pulled into these stories. We see it in viral, strangely viral stories about really disturbing, I think, but they're everywhere and they're still everywhere, right? Like the football player asking the disabled girl to prom or the like random stranger who helps somebody at a fast food restaurant, get their tray. Like these stories are really loud and everybody applauds, but there's something gnarlier going on there. Um, and a lot of it has to do with um, dignity, right? Like wanting disabled people to be able to go out into the world and have dignity and be seen. Um, and, and also there are so many ways to be genuinely helpful that don't have to do with like running after someone and demanding that you miss them, right? Like employing people, hiring people onto your team, listening to people, uh, their input as you're designing a building or an app or, um, there's so many ways that there's lasting, genuine kindness that includes people in your community and doesn't kind of push us into these separate categories of helpless um, and perpetuate that story. So well, I don't know. I have a little question. Bit about it. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure if this was in your, the chapter or not, but I was wondering if there was an intersectionality that you experience as well. Is is you're also a woman? Yeah. And I don't know if you what you think about that and if, if that means that this kind of, uh, I don't, this um, e epidemic of kindness, it gets visited upon you maybe more than on yeah. men. I think there's actually, I, I think that's a really smart question, Amy. And I think that actually there's a lot of intersecting identities that have led to my experience of kindness. I think, um, I think it's being a woman. I think it's, it's being, a thin white woman in the suburbs, you know, like I think that I fit into a story where I, I can think of um, 
disabled homeless people, right. That are not getting that kind of extension of kindness. Um, that doesn't seem to fit into the story in the same way. And, and so I, I do want to be really careful about the way that I talk about it because there is genuine kindness that needs to happen. I do think that we need to reach out to one another and, and figure out how to make a kinder world that cares for us. But the way that it works for my particular intersection of identities uh, just doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and I think that um, it, it, we, we see that in a lot of different um, spaces. Uh, well, you, and we, I think you write really effectively about it, Rebecca. Oh, good. And I, do, I didn't hear you at all as arguing against kindness. <laughs> good. You know, it's, you. <laughs> people somehow do. Um, I heard you as arguing against a certain kind of behavior in a certain tone deafness, or I'm sorry, that's a horrible thing to say, like a certain, um, you know, inability to listen, really understand what's happening and listen to what's going on. Um, and, and that advice you give of really genuinely thinking about what you're doing and thinking about the environment you're creating and maybe doing higher level things is probably yeah. kinder than, yeah. um, help, you know, forcing someone to accept my help as they're trying to get into their car. Right. Um, one of my, one of the stories that I really loved is actually you tell the story of falling out of your wheelchair and your friend kind of going, you're a badass. Yeah. And I like that because it's such a lens shift. Mm -hmm. um, she could easily have seen you in a different way. And what a good friend. I mean, she saw you as you wanted to be seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah, thank you for bringing that moment back up. I actually got goosebumps remembering that just because of what it felt like the difference that that felt I felt in that moment was dignity, right? Like she yeah. held on to my dignity for me. Um, she knew I was completely fine in the mechanics of what had happened. Um, and what I really needed there was someone to hold on to my dignity until I was back into my seat and composed. And, um, and she did that beautifully. Right. And it came through and you wrote about it really wonderfully. Um, so before we leave, uh, there's, I think I've mentioned to you, you have this fabulous dramatic arc to this book um, and you end like on an unbelievable, like several cliffhangers. Um, one is that you do end up having a child. Congratulations. And um, what's your child's name? Do you His mind? His name is Otto. Auto, mm -hmm. um, awesome. And the, another is um, that your husband gets cancer, gets diagnosed with cancer. But you told me before, if you want to let everybody know how yes. he's doing. Yes, I feel I feel um, so <laughs> guilty that the book ended that way, even though there was I was literally writing up until like the last second that they would let me. But it's such a cliffhanger, and I hate that anybody is like out there worrying. Um, Micah is doing really well. He, um, it was like, I think last week that he actually had the scans and blood work that marked a year and a half of no signs of cancer returning to his body, which is wow. everything to us. Um, he's, he's definitely, uh, struggling to adapt to his new body. His body is different forever, has changed. It's unpredictable. It's unfamiliar to him. And so that's an interesting thing for us to process as a couple. Um, most of his life, he's never even had to think about having a body. And so suddenly he's kind of thrown into this new experience, but, um, but the big picture, um, piece is that the cancer hasn't returned and a year and a half feels good. Um, we're really eager for, to put more time between us and that diagnosis, but, um, yeah, we're, he's doing well. Um, so I'm so grateful. I can say that. Yeah. And I'm glad that you can say that as well. And, and you wrote so beautifully about it. Um, at the end of your book, um, you wrote so much has changed in my tiny world in the great wide world. Since I wrote that first scattered words of this book, my partner's healthy body has revealed its own mortality. My disabled body has flexed its majestic muscles. At the very same time, the virus has brought to the forefront the inherent frailties that come with living in a body. That was really beautiful. Um, and I think the, a wonderful ending to the book. So thank you. Um, I, there are some, we have a question from Kelly, that, from a listener. Um, Kelly says, can you give advice for the best way to break down barriers, writer's block when starting to write about myself? Oh, so here's a writing Kelly. Question. Kelly. That is such a good question. Um, the, 
uh, the, for me, the built-in vulnerability of writing about yourself and then letting anyone read it, anyone at all is, um, excruciating. In fact, I think even when you're not writing about yourself, I think anytime you're writing anything that's sort of coming from you, that's that's coming from the real soul self of you. And then sharing that with someone is vulnerable. Um, so I guess to begin, I would just say, um, let's not underestimate that vulnerability or act like that's smaller than it really is. That is a big, scary thing. Um, so I, I, um, prefer to start with trusted people, um, of only letting my sisters, um, or Micah, um, read something before I let anyone else's eyes on it or ears. Um, I, uh, I think it's important to have trusted readers that can, um, kind of, um, hold you in that experience and, um, and know you like, know what it is that you're, um, wanting to get to, even if you're not there yet. Um, when I was working on writing this book, I definitely did give myself a period where I pretended like no one would ever read it ever. Um, and I think that at least giving yourself some space to do that will allow you to maybe write the things that you didn't even know you were capable of writing down. Um, those truths that, um, maybe are scary to look at on the page. I definitely have moments in the book, um, that were that way for me, that felt that way for me. Um, and you know what, in the end, there were some things that I thought, nope, you know, that's too much. I'm going to keep that for myself. Um, and you can give yourself time to kind of suss out what belongs in, in which space. Um, so I would say, yeah, giving yourself a chance to just write as if no one would ever see it and seeing what comes of that. And then giving yourself time to sort of go back and, and rearrange and, and, um, maybe keep a few nuggets to yourself and maybe feel strong about sharing a few others with a few trusted few and then build from there. Um, but oof, that is, that is a real thing. Um, and, and it doesn't always feel great. And, in, and there's no guarantee. I wish there was a way that I would say, follow this recipe and then it will never feel bad. <laughs> um, but I think inevitably that there, when you share something that you've written and maybe double when you write it about something that's true about yourself, um, there are times when it, it, it feels, um, you feel the roughness of that tender vulnerability. So I wish you all the best and all the safe places for doing that writing. Um, well, I think and then we have another question. That's almost the flip in a way. Um, it's from Alan and Alan says, I hope you write a follow-up to this because I love your writing. And I have to agree with Alan. I really appreciated your writing as well. Um, and Alan asks, will you ever write a nonfiction book about a subject other than yourself? which I think is an interesting question. It is an interesting question, Alan. I mean, oof, let me write the second book um, first. I'm kind of- I know we need to follow up really to this one. For yes, and I'm, I'm, in the, I'm, I'm trying to get ready for the second book. I, I think that has to be about kind of, Amy, what you pointed out in the epilogue. There's a lot to, um, for me to um, pull out there. And I think I'm driven in large part to write for, um, understanding, like when I'm perplexed by something or when I'm, um, overwhelmed or confused about something. And I, I, I don't know what to do with it. That's when I write. So Alan, I think, yeah, I think if there was something, whatever the next thing is, um, I think, um, well, I think my next, next thing is I got to write about this cancer motherhood pandemic time, but after that, you know, whatever, whatever it is that puzzles me, um, or intrigues me that I, I need to spend some time with, I would totally dive into um, a topic that, honestly, that sounds really appealing right now. I think you've maybe played through this other than you. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, wouldn't that be? Yeah. I, I think th- it will be tough to top cancer, motherhood, book coming out, pandemic. Could like that everything. just be my, you know, <laughs> peace out. I've written my two books. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see for sure. Um, I think even writing, I think there could be something about writing some fiction um, that I would be interested in. Um, that was way back in the day, I was writing more fiction than anything else. So maybe going back to some of that would be fun too. I don't know, Alan, but I like the question. I like the question too. And Jen Dewey is back, which means it must be time to wrap up. Sadly, it is. I feel like I could listen to you to keep talking for another hour. That was wonderful. Do you I have want any... Rebecca to come to Denver so we can hang out? Like, oh my goodness. Really? <laughs> I want that. I want to do that for sure. 
this when when everything settles down if you ever come to Denver I hope you'll come to the library and, yes uh, me I definitely for sure I could talk with you much longer Amy this was this was very fun thank you for such all a that. pleasure Rebecca I feel honored to have had this conversation with you all right Jen thank you both so much that was such a warm honest raw and like also such a joyful conversation to listen to so um thank you both so much um, everyone can find Rebecca on Instagram at sitting underscore pretty. Rebecca, is there anywhere else you would like for folks to find you online? You know, that is the main spot where people can find me. Um, I also have a website, um, RebeccaTossig.com, um, where you can kind of find the latest. Um, but yeah, Instagram is a great spot too. We'll keep an eye out for that second book too. So okay. as it comes. <laughs> um, yes. And um, everyone, please go visit Tattered Cover at tatteredcover.com and help them celebrate their 50th anniversary. And please come visit the library, Denver Public Library in person or online for more programs like this one at denverlibrary.com. And thank you again. And thanks everyone for joining us this evening. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Jen. Bye, Rebecca. It was great to talk to you. Thank you, everyone. It was wonderful to talk to you both too. Thank you. Bye.